Hi everyone, I'm Karen Toulon and welcome to Black in Focus. I'm here at the Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York and I'm thrilled to welcome two people. We've been chatting a lot before we started. Anna Gifty and Fanta Treore, um, who founded the Sadie Collective back in 2018. Um, and they founded it after meeting and connecting on LinkedIn. So we're having a full circle moment, which is really wild. Um, and they founded the Sadie Collective to address pipeline and pathway problems for Black women in economics and related fields. Um, black women account for only about 1% of those working in economics in the U.S. And Anna and Fanta would argue that if your goals are confronting complex issues with innovative solutions, it matters who's asking the questions. So welcome, Anna and Fanta. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. It is great to see you. And um, to everyone who is watching, if you have any questions for Anna Fanta, you can just drop them into the uh, comments uh, box. Okay, so about four uh, years ago, before COVID, before Black Lives Matter, before the loss of about half a million US lives, you know, about 30 million jobs and counting, countless small businesses, you two got together on LinkedIn and thought, hang on, what the world needs now more than ever are more black women economists. Um, you were about 21 and 24 years old at the time, and you thought you could actually do this and be successful. What was going through your minds? I'll, I'll go ahead and let Fanta actually take that one. All righty, Fanta, <laughs> sure. you're on. Yeah, so we have a bias towards action, and that really comes from our own personal approaches. And I'll speak a little bit about mine and then pass it on to Anna. And so I grew up with a mother who's an entrepreneur in New York City, and she made a business for herself without actually having massive amounts of capital. And that experience, coupled with working in the social entrepreneurship ecosystem prior to working at the Fed, made me biased towards acting. So, so that experience of, you know, being around young entrepreneurs between 15 and 22 years old in Africa who are starting businesses without capital, who are problem solvers, who are young people with a really large imagination um, made it so that when Anna approached me about an idea that she had to organize an event for Black women in economics be a no-brainer. Also, I found myself at the Federal Reserve and being in those spaces, it was very obvious to me the <laughs> lack of Black women, <laughs> being the only Black woman in many of the rooms that I was in talking about international finance topics. And that um, was very obvious. And for you know someone who may not be a Black woman, they may not notice that. And so Anna also had similar experiences. So we got together and we thought, OK, let's go ahead and do something about this. So Anna, so when you were talking with Fanta, what what why the Sadie? Why the Sadie Collective? Where does the name come from, and and what was the object objective? Yeah, you know, so the idea really started off with the conference, um, and so the conference is sort of bringing together Black women in economics. And this was after we both went to a conference called the American Economic Meetings, um, where we were, you know, meeting together, and we heard from an economist called Dr. Rhonda V. Sharp, who's currently the president and founder of Wiser Policy Institute which is a think tank for women of color in particular. And so in that speech that she was giving, she was talking about the lack of black women coming into economics, right? There's already a very, very small number of black women in economics, but the pipeline is actually even worse than what is currently happening within the field. And so when, we, when I approached Fanta about the idea, it really was a text that came out of multiple months of conversation around, you know, what does diversity in economics look like? You know, we are both entering spaces that are going to be predominantly white, predominantly male. How do we ensure that we are seeing ourselves in those spaces, but also making sure that the resources that we have been so blessed to have through um, folks like Dr. Lisa D. Cook, who is currently a professor at Michigan State University, um, how do we make sure that those resources and those individuals are connected to our community and our friends, et cetera? And so really the conference was my idea, but the organization was Fanta's. And so Fanta said, you know, why don't we actually organize events and programming around this conference? And that's really how things got started. Wow. And so the Sadie Collective now has an annual conference. And of course, we should talk about the original Sadie, who was the first Black 
woman economist in the United States, Sadie Alexander, who unfortunately because of racism and sexism actually did not practice as an economist. She practiced as a lawyer. Yeah. Um, but you, you do the conference, you also put women together with resources and other material. But what I find most fascinating is the work you do around your around your your research letters and your and this amazing open letter that you did an open letter to economic institutions in June of 2020 um, that I kind of see as a little bit of a watershed moment um, it was right after the killing of George Floyd um, Anna do you want to start off talking about this because I kind of see that as a real moment. Absolutely. So, you know, for those who don't know, the George Floyd protests really picked up quite a bit during the summer of 2020. Um, police brutality has been an ongoing national crisis in our country forever, but it really has picked up a lot of steam over the last few years due to efforts um, such as Campaign Zero, et cetera, um, and the ongoing protests and organizers who are on the ground. And so we really use this moment as a way to essentially talk to those who are in power, right? You know, one thing that Fonta and I both noticed on Twitter is that around George Floyd's murder, essentially none of the economists were talking. Nobody was saying a single word about it. And that was really concerning to us, considering that they actually sit in the rooms of people who make these decisions surrounding policies. And they also provide the analyses that justify why policies exist. And so we really looked at the open letter alongside our community and our wonderful team at the time as a way to really say, this is what needs to be done. We have been in this profession for maybe a limited amount of time, but we've been black our entire lives. And so when we think about the intersection of those two experiences, it's absolutely critical that economic institutions rise to the occasion and start addressing these issues, excuse me. And, and Fanta, what are those issues? Because some people may not be able to see that line, snap that line from race to economic policy. Can you help, can you help connect those dots, please? Absolutely. So a statement that we often hear institutions say is that they are world class institutions or they're striving to be. And the reality is that they cannot become that or be that if they don't have diverse decision makers in the room helping to inform the trajectory of their organization. So for any organization, whether it's a policy program or economics department or a central bank, diversity is absolutely essential in order for good policies to be created. And bringing it back to economists and why we're focusing specifically on economists, we understand that economists help to shape the world. So like Anna shared, they are in these rooms with decision makers if they are not the decision makers and helping to inform that the work that they do. And so in that, um, it's very critical that that population actually mm -hmm. represents the larger society. And with having less than 1% in these institutions, this means that the population um, that is currently there um, isn't able to serve those who are in our broader society. So one economist who's now in the room, very much so, is at the Labor Department, Chief Economist uh, Janelle Jones. Um, and, and she's someone who you, you know quite well, and she's caused a bit of a stir with her Black women best phrase. Um, can you talk a little bit about what that means? And, and some people are kind of interpreting that as um, uh, some people who have will have less because it's going to be given to other people. Um, what does what does she mean by black women best? Um, and how does that relate to policy? Yeah, so black women best essentially boiled down says, if we center economic policies on improving the economic outcomes of black women, everybody subsequently benefits. And another way to think about it is the best outcome for black women in the economy is a better outcome for everyone else. So what does that mean? It means that Black women are essentially worse off on a number of economic indicators across the board. And so if we are ensuring that Black women have access to housing, if we are forgiving Black women student debt, if we are ensuring that Black women have access to resources if they're small business owners, it turns out that Black women are actually worse off than everybody else. So getting Black women those resources and forgiving that debt, et cetera, actually translates to every other group within the United States. 
And to add on to what Anna so eloquently shared is that the reality of America is that we live in a racialized society. And Isabel Wilkerson talks about in her latest book, Cast, about how we have a caste system. So being born in a particular racial group leads to a correlation with certain outcomes. And economists like Derek Hamilton, Sandy Darity, and also Dr. Rhonda Vanshay Sharp champion this idea of disaggregated data and how critical that is to creating a better society. So Black Women Best is really paying attention to this idea of intersectionality and also the importance of using disaggregated data in this caste system that we were born into in order to have better outcomes. Disaggregated data is something that's starting to um catch on a bit. I, I, we, we've been chatting a little bit about that. And, and I think that's something that you're hearing more about. I mean, something that we certainly do talk about at Bloomberg. Um, for example, we do know that the unemployment rate is, you know, nationwide is, let's say, 6.2%. Mm -hmm. But the Black unemployment rate is 10%. Um, and then we look at something like the women's workforce participation rate. It's at a 33-year low. I mean, these wow. are very, very different ways of slicing employment, right? Um, and so it does really matter. Um, and then Dr. Cecilia Rouse, who's actually going to be speaking at our Equality Summit um, today here at Bloomberg, um, she's actually talking more about looking at race and gender when assessing the uh, success um, of programs. Um, and we also just uh, looked at the cost of slavery um, to the US economy um, and society. We have a paycheck podcast that I believe I sent you and I also just posted it to LinkedIn um, that looks at different um, effects of slavery on, on, on the US society. For example, um, $42 trillion in, in, in current dollars um, is the value um, that slavery has added to white society. Wow. Um, uh, two hundred million dollars was the amount of value that's been extracted from the black from black society due to lynchings and the destruction of the black Wall Street, ex for example. Mm -hmm. um, and that seventy five percent of of American wealth is tied to home ownership. Mm -hmm. Thus, seventy five percent of white fam families own homes. Um, five four percent of black families own homes. 2% mm -hmm. of Hispanic families own homes, which is from Fed data. Um, and so when you look at um, policies, um, let's talk a little bit about the Fed perhaps. And, and Fanta, you, you worked at the Fed. Um, Jerome Powell in 2020, about the same time you put out your, your open letter to economic institutions, he actually came out and, and, and talked about uh, the effects of racism. And the Fed's been talking a little bit more and more about really recognizing that race is indeed a factor in, in economic life. Um, do you have any thoughts about what more the Fed should be doing? That your 2020 letter did actually have some, some proposals about what the Fed needed to do in terms of hiring and staffing and training. Any movement on that? Yeah, so the, the Fed addressing systemic racism for the first time is pretty remarkable. And even with our current president saying in his speech, you know, white supremacy and also systemic racism must be addressed is it's it's now I'm just really excited that we're finally having these conversations, because what has often happened for black people in these spaces is that you have a sense of double consciousness, which is a term coined by W.B. Dubois, and you're basically not bringing your full self to a space mm -hmm. because you recognize the power of racism. Um, and so with the Fed in particular and what can be done and what we have been seeing happening is that the other Fed presidents across the system have also shared some statements around what um, the toll of structural racism is on the economy. So we had Neil Kashkri, who was the former president of the Minneapolis Fed, release a statement about how expensive it is on the economy and how it must be addressed. We also have the first African-American president of the Atlanta Fed uh, 
Raphael Bostic also sharing similar sentiments. So it's great to see that these conversations are happening and there is much more that needs to be done. And in our open letter, we created, uh, we have very specific and clear suggestions for what needs to happen. And one of the clearest ways to affect change is to hire black economists. And currently at the Fed in DC, there are zero black economists out of 400. That is terrible. Mm -hmm. And that is the reason why we found ourselves in the Great Recession. The lack of diversity at the table to see that there were mortgage lending that was occurring to Black people who were in the middle class. Heather McGee's, McGee's work speaks to this. Um, and who were getting terrible, terrible rates is why we found ourselves in that recession. And if there were Black economists and people with the lived experiences that are related to those communities, then maybe we could have caught that and we wouldn't have had the impact that we've seen globally with our recession. The US is a very powerful nation and what happens in the US impacts the economies all over the world. And I worked in the international finance division at the Fed. And so the data that I was working with shows that some countries have not rebounded from the great recession. So moving forward, it's very important that the United States address its structural racism by putting resources behind what the issues we're seeing now. And so with COVID and the recession we are in now, it's very critical that it's well-resourced. And in our open letter, we also touched on the fact that investing in this pipeline that we are building at the Sadie Collective so that we do have Black economists is going to be critical moving forward. So what are you planning for this year ahead? What what are there are there certain benchmarks that you have uh, that you want to see achieved? Uh Absolutely, I love this question because the Sadie Collective is a huge part of my life. Whether I am talking about my work um, as a student, I'm a dual degree student right now at Yale studying policy and also business, um, or Outside of that, I make sure that all the work that I'm doing as a student correlates with what I'm doing at the Sadie Collective. And so at the Sadie Collective, we just held our third annual conference and we had about 400 people in attendance from all across the world. And we featured the likes of Dean Erica James, the first black woman and first uh, black and woman Dean at the Wharton Business School. We also had Dambisa Moyo, who's an incredible macroeconomist, come to join us as well. And a series of workshops and panels and plenaries for our attendees to participate in. And that included 17 different types of events and skills building workshops. And so with the numbers that we're seeing in the economics profession, what is really stark is how many black women are studying on the PhD level economics. And at that level, we're seeing less than 1%. This means four black women in all of the entire country is graduating with a PhD in economics. When we're looking on the undergraduate level, it's about 600. So when Anna and I were graduating from our, from our programs, there are about 600 black women from across the United States who were graduating with an undergraduate degree in economics. And what this means is that there is a whole sector of the economy that black women do not have access to. And it's one of the most lucrative, especially when we're talking about social science degrees. So whether it's sociology, psychology, et cetera, economics is one of those degrees that will allow one to be able to earn a lot and allow you to affect change in the economy, whether you go to a financial firm, a consulting firm, or, into a master's or PhD program. So the Sadie Collective is all about bringing access to information to black women around these issues, but also doing skills building. And we also work closely with the institutions who are interested in having a change in the diversity numbers that they have, but then also in creating better policy. And so with that, we have programming that is cater towards black women specifically, but then also to our allies to help them take care of these incredible talented women who come into their spaces, but may deal with issues 
because of the lack of diversity that has historically been there and the structural racism that may be inherent to their institutions. Yeah. What, do you tell, what do you tell allies, Anna? What do you tell allies at institutions, whether they're at farms <laughs> or at, at, um, at colleges or universities? Yeah. What, what do you tell ad allies to do? Yeah, you know, so I think it's a couple of things, right? You know, we have a very deep understanding that these institutions ultimately are built upon, you know, a white supremacist foundation, right? This sort of country was built upon that. And so get, keeping that in mind, we know that these institutions have resources that they can put towards Black women in particular. And so that's what we ask for, directly that. We say, we would like these resources. This is what we're going to do with these resources. And we also make sure that we're holding these institutions accountable, right? So it's not that we're taking your money and we're leaving. We are you know, making sure that we're using the resources that you are giving us and then moving forward with you as a partner to ensure that you are better off as an institution that can then accept these black women, right? We don't believe in setting up black women, especially our members for failure, right? We believe that you know, if we're going to be partnering with an institution, if we're going to be having an institution recruit at our conference, that they're actually prepared to receive these black women, not just in terms of having opportunities available to them, but in terms of making sure that they can foster a wonderful wonderful work in place and work environment for them, that they can mentor them, et cetera, so that there's a lasting impact there. And one thing I also wanna mention is that we are now marking this shift in terms of strategic leadership by having now Fanta Charade as our new CEO, which is effective this past week. And then I'm also now serving as the chair of our advisory board with um, a number of leading individuals and experts who are across finance, economics, policy, and the like, just to show that, you know, one, we are really dedicated to making sure that this organization outlasts us, and two, that this mission actually re um, goes out and reaches the global population. Uh, but I want to go back just a little bit to, to organizations. When you're asking sure. them for resources, what exactly are you asking of organizations, of companies or uh, academic institutions? What do, what do you actually ask? What does the ask? Are you what does asking, he ask? What, yeah. Are you asking for sponsors? Are you asking for, specific, for, for funds to set up programs? What, are, what does the ask? Yeah. So historically, what we've asked for is funding, almost always associated with some level of programming. Um, so a really great example is our recent partnership with the Gates Foundation. And so the Gates Foundation is offering us a multi-year funding, which I believe Fanta can speak more to. And then the, uh, on top of that, there's going to be associated programming um, and associated research um, efforts to ensure that not only are we, again, looking at ensuring that black women are entering the pipeline, but that they are able to actually get through the pipeline to their desired destination. But I think Fanta can also speak more to that as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one thing that I think it's important to highlight is that when we come into some of these conversations with organizations or institutions, um, there's this idea that black women are self-selecting out of economics. And mm -hmm. we have done research that shows that is actually not the case and in fact, at our 2021 conference, we had an attendee return and present research. And this attendee attended our 2020 conference where she had access to role models in the field. So in a field where you have so few black economists, her being able to see people like Dr. Cook and Janet um, Yellen and um, Janelle Jones and all these people who are in the economics space and who are doing an incredible um, service through the work that they're doing and um, that kind of shifting her perspective and also Anna and my own on what it looks like to be an economist. So part of what we're doing here is redefining what it means to be an economist and what that has led to is this young woman who came to our conference declaring an economics major when initially she was interested in engineering and now she's in a four plus one program. She'll be graduating with a master's in economics. At our conference, she presented her own original research. And what this speaks to is how information isn't being dispersed and also in a way that is interesting and applicable for black women and people of color in this field. And econ one-on-one -on -one classes do an incredible disservice when they say things like ceteris paribus, considering all things equal. Um, when as we were saying earlier, disaggregated data and nuance is so critical. So we are 
pushing institutions to redefine and, and reimagine what it means to be an economist and to also democratize access to education in the field. And so that looks like building programs with them. It looks like having them come to our career fair and hearing about the brilliant work that our membership are currently doing in the field with pushing critical and really interesting questions that tie to and is informed by their lived experiences. I was just reading some of the comments that we've been getting, and we've been getting a lot of comments about how, you know, just talking about the, you know, the good work that you've been doing. But what, you know, a couple of questions about has the Fed commented on, um, you're pointing out their lack of diversity. Um, have mm -hmm. you heard from the Fed at all? Has it, was there a response to your open letter um, suggesting mm -hmm. more uh, hiring of, of, of researchers, of economists, of, of, of other people at the Fed? Have you heard? Yes, yeah, so we have had Chair Janet Yellen involved with our conference from its very inception in 2019, which is when we had our first conference, and also Governor Brainerd came to speak at that very first one. So the Fed has been aware of our work and has been really interested in it. And in fact, we've also partnered with the Chicago Fed and also the Board of Governors, where we facilitated sessions that allowed a curated experience for Black women in particular um, in the space. And we've also facilitated questions and experiences around anti-racism specifically for staff at the Fed to engage with us and to think about what they could be doing differently and better. And I've actually presented those findings to Chair Powell and Governor Brainerd, and some of them have been implemented, which is incredibly exciting to see. And there's still a lot of work to be done. And we are continuing to cultivate a relationship with the Federal Reserve so that we can see better policy being implemented. And very quickly, because we have just a, a minute or two, um, what are some, some policies that you're looking to, at for this current administration? What are some things that you think really need to be done that you would like to see happen from a policy perspective? Um, Anna, you mentioned um, student debt, for example, as being really, really, really linked to to wealth building for the Black community. Are there are there yeah. some things that you think are really important? Yes, absolutely. So there are a number of different issues that I think the Biden administration is well positioned, de definitely um, according to the people that they just recently appointed um, to several economic positions that I think that they can really take on. So first and foremost, like as you mentioned, student debt is tied to wealth building, especially with respect to black folks in this country. And I would say more specifically, black Americans in this country. And so economist Derek Hamilton has done a lot of work around this. He wrote a New York op-ed with some, um, another expert, excuse me, that really addressed sort of how forgiving student debt is really about ensuring that Black folks have the ability to build wealth in this country. And so, you know, if we're thinking about Black women best in particular, Black women have the highest student debt on average. And so if we're talking about the only plan right now that actually addresses their student debt, which is around $40,000, it's Schumer and Warren's plan, which has been backed by Congresswoman Ayanna Presley and the like, right? So, you know, that is the only plan really that says we're gonna forgive up to $50,000 of debt. Well, then that accounts for this marginalized group, again, black women being worse off than everybody else that needs to be addressed. And so that's one thing that the Biden administration can definitely look to. Obviously minimum wage increases, right? And that really comes along with a federal job guarantee. So this is something that, you know, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley has been talking quite a bit about. She again co-authored um, co a resolution with economist Nina Banks, as well as Derek Hamilton and um, the co-founder and um, CEO of PolicyLink to really talk about, hey, you know, everybody deserves a dignified job, a job that pays at least $15 and is offered by the federal government. And this is really to ensure that everybody lives a dignified life. And so that is really kind of at the core of racial justice and economic justice, ensuring that people have the ability to build wealth and also have financial freedom within our country. And I think to go further, I would say also that there needs to be small business funding available for especially black businesses that have been disproportionately affected. Um, and that, you know, employment benefits in, in particular um, are also in abundance so that black women in particular who are disproportionately rep represented in essential work, now dubbed essential work, as, except, you know, the, the essential work doesn't have essential benefits. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. this is really what we need moving forward. People need to be dignified in the work that they're doing. And I know Fanta may have some um, last words to add to that as well. 
In fact, I, I, maybe you'll include in there, I, you know, anything that the Fed may do around really looking at some of its levers that it can control. For example, the the CRA, the the Community Reinvestment Act, which some might say is more of a rubber stamp, and if it might be able to kind of actually put some meat behind that that tool and require bank, you know, to be more um, discerning in how it really uses that 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 lever that it actually can can use and yeah. how it assesses. Can you can you comment at all on that? Sure. So so to finish out what Anna was sharing around policy recommendations, I'd also just emphasize that Dr. Sadie TM Alexander has been talking about a federal job at guarantee since um, her times and her her work. So I implore everyone to go learn more about her and all of the work that she's done as an economist. And she wasn't able to practice, but she did some really groundbreaking, riveting work during a time where segregation was rampant. And Dr. Nina Banks actually has a story on her life that she's publishing in the, in the coming months. So definitely look out for that. On the topic of the Community Reinvestment Act, it's, um, it's a space that I am more so um, not as equipped to discuss, given that my work was focused on international finance. Um, so, mm -hmm. so with that, I think that um, someone else would probably be best positioned to, mm -hmm. answer, to answer that question. Okay. All righty. Well, you know what? I think we're going to leave it there because we have been going on and we could talk for a very, very long time, but it's been fantastic speaking with you, Bonta and Anna of the Sadie Collective. I urge everyone to to uh, look up uh, the organization. They're doing a lot of good work and you can, they can, you can read more and learn more. If you're interested in economics, I urge you to to uh, look them up. Um, they're very accessible uh, and you can certainly learn more about the Sadie Collective and the wonderful world of economics. Thank you both. Next week, we are diving into real estate. Um, I'll be joined by Jean Brownhill, who is the CEO of Sweden. Um, we have a lot of uh, real estate data a little bit this week and next week. Um, there's a lot going on. I know uh, real estate's a hot topic in my household because I've been trapped at home with my husband and the one big office is just not working. We're putting up walls. Um, so hopefully you'll, you'll join us then. Uh, but until then, for all of us here at Bloomberg, I'm Karen Toulon and this is Bloomberg. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you for having us.